Greetings, everyone, and welcome in this webinar. In today's session, we'll be discussing about occupational hazard identification, risk assessment, and risk control. My name is Susanna Ayete, the PCB organizer of this webinar, and the guest for today is Mr. Stephen Lim, Managing Director, Principal Consultant, and Trainer of HB Power Horizon, and also PCB Certified Trainer. Please write your questions and comments in the question box in the right hand control panel and Mr. Steven will answer to them accordingly. Moreover, if you want to participate directly with Mr. Steven in discussion, you can also raise your hand and then we will unmute you so you can make your questions directly to him. Please, Mr. Lim, you may start the presentation. Thank you, Susanna. Welcome, everybody. My name is Steven. I'm from JP Power, Malaysia. Um, it's very nice of you to spend your time here for, uh, for a short while. Uh, let's go through the topic tonight. Um, the topic, as you can see on the screen right now, is actually is about occupational hazard identification, risk assessment and risk control. In short, we call it HIREC. Now, basically, um, a little bit about my, myself, I'm a, I'm a full-time consultant and trainer, as well as an auditor um, with uh, several certification body. And uh, I'm in this profession for the past 12, 12 years. So in Malaysia, um, my company, JP Power, is actually organizing and uh, we carry out a lot of consultation and training uh, services to clients all over Malaysia as well as the ASEAN country. So tonight, I would like to share with you one of the topics uh, which is uh, one of my core competency areas. Um, being as an OSHA certified uh, auditor myself and uh, being a, a trainer myself in the occupational safety and health uh, industry, um, I've seen and I would like to share with you uh, a few points here in regards to HIREC. Um, the information that you will see and uh, you're going to listen from this presentation is actually for uh, knowledge sharing. Um, there is no absolute answer to the, uh, the topic and of course is I welcome any comments and questions from the audience. Now this is a presentation, uh, as, as you can see on the screen here, the, the, the rationale of this program is to provide the basic uh, understanding of the HIREC, which is, stands for Identification, Risk Assessment and Risk Control. Um, and uh, as you're aware, HIREC is part of the requirements of OSHAS 18001. Um, and as well as the, the one, sub, one of the legal requirements I, uh, in most countries, uh, including Malaysia. Now let's go through a quick one uh, in regards to the uh, OSHA's 18,000 requirements, um, and uh, especially its, its relationship with HIREC. Now as you can see on the screen right now, under the clause 4.3.1, there is a specific requirement uh, stated hazard, hazard identification, risk assessment, and determining the controls. So as a whole, this clause requires an organization to identify the hazards, the occupational hazards at the workplace, assess the risks of the hazards, and determine the proper countermeasures, or we call control measures, to control the hazards. And uh, it's part of the requirement of OSHAS 4.3.1 that states that the, the OSHAS has to be regularly kept up to date, and the assessment has to be conducted, and uh, the results from the, from the HIREC will be uh, used in the setting up of the OSH objectives and programs. Now, um, when do we need to do risk assessment or in this area here we call high rec? Well, and as part of the requirement in OSHAS, the very basic uh, fundamental on when to conduct in high rec is when uh, we establish a new organization or when we set up a, a, new, a new factory or a new plant. Now, bear in mind that uh, high rec is not to be used only in the manufacturing sector, but uh, actually high rec is uh, can be used in various industries and sectors. So when, when we mention the word organization, it refers to all types of organization uh, irrespective of which industry they are in. The second scenario when an hire is required is when there is a change or changes in the work patterns in the workplace or there is a significant change in the materials, machineries and process. 
Now, bear in mind, in countries, in our countries, we have regulations and we have laws in regards to the occupational safety and health. So once, uh, occasionally, these laws and regulations uh, would go through amendments. So whenever there are amendments uh, occur, it is a requirement for the organization to be aware of the amendments and uh, to review the hierarchy of yes. Of yes. And uh, if there is any technological improvement or change, it is also required for the organization to review the hierarchy. Now let's go through some quick terminology and understanding and the definitions of some words that we, we use in HIREC. Now when we conduct HIREC, it is very important that we have to consider the routine and the non-routine activities that occur in the company. Well as you can see on the screen here, the definition of routine and non-routine activities are, are quite clearly defined here. Hazard. Hazard is actually defined as a situation or a source of situation where a potential harm uh, could, could uh, for a potential for harm in terms of human injury or ill health, damage to property, damage to environment, or the combination of these. Now, risk is actually a combination of the likelihood of occurrence of a hazard as well as the severity of the hazard. Now, there are many ways to determine the risk or to assess the risk level. Um, in this case here, here is one example how risk can be assessed. Where we use the, in, in, this, in this presentation, looking at the quantitative way, and there are some organizations where they assess the risk by using qualitative methods. But this over here tonight, I'll be showing you the, uh, an example of a quantitative method uh, used to assess the risk level. Uh, HIREC is a short form, as you can see here. Uh, it begins with HI, which stands for Hazard Identification. It is a requirement for the organization to identify hazards in the workplace. Once the hazards has been identified, it is very important that uh, the the risk level of the hazard to be evaluated, to be assessed. And RC. RC stands for risk control. It is where it is very important that when after we have determined the risk level of the hazard, the organization must determine and identify what will be the practical risk control measures to be taken in order to mitigate eliminate or to reduce the risk. Now as you can see on the screen here, there are many purposes of, of why an high rate is important. Now basically, what I can see here is that I can, I can sum it to say that uh, high rate is actually is a beneficial way of uh, helping an em uh, employees okay, and the employers to ensure the work environment is safe and is conducive for everybody. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let's look, look, let's look at this, uh, the next slides. We will be talking about the methodologies and the de development of hazard identification, risk assessment, and risk control. Basically, there are four steps, four simple steps to begin. We will begin by classifying the types of work activities that, that we have in the organization. So the organization would have to list down, identify and list down what are the activities they have in the organization. And followed by identification of the hazard, followed by risk assessment, and finally decide the necessity to control the risk. The four leaks likes will give you a much more detailed explanation how these four simple steps are to be carried out. Ladies and gentlemen, in a workplace, in an, in an organization, there are many activities that we can look into. Now we can classify the work activities in organization by number one, in terms of the, geographic, ge the geographical or the physical areas within or the outside of the premise. 
Two, we can classify the activities of an, of an organization in terms of its processes. And three, we must look into all the routine and the non-routine activities that occur in the organization. So do not forget, the key point here is routine and non-routine activities. Now, what is the example of routine activities? Now, for example, if you talk about a company, uh, let's say, for example, uh, a manufacturing company that uh, manufactures a die-cast product. So the routine activities are, example, the die-casting processes. Okay, all the processes in the die-casting processes are, we consider as routine activities. And what about the non-routine activities? Example, in the same company, the non-routine activities could be maintenance of the machines, breakdown of the machines where it requires repairing, rework of the products, okay, and visits by visitors where this is considered as a non-routine activity. Now, once we have identified these activities, and in each activity, we need to identify what are the occupational hazards that exist in that activity. Now, there are many types of hazards. So before we start the identification of the hazard, it is very important that we have to understand what are the types of hazards that may have in organization. In a simplified form, there are seven types of hazards, as you can see on the screen here. So as you can see, we have chemical hazards, we have physical hazards, we have biological hazards, we have economic hazards, mechanical, electrical, and fire explosion hazards. Now before we go much further, let me give you some examples of what we call chemical hazards. For example, let's take Let's take a look at the, the die cast company. I believe they use chemicals, chemicals in their routine activities, and as well as chemicals they use in the non-routine activities, example, chemicals they use during the machine repairing works. The physical activities, the physical hazards, example, hazards that are related to um, injuries caused by physical objects caused by machineries being hit, uh, 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 objects that fall from the, uh, the from the um, from the from a uh, high place, all right, heat, burn, biological hazards. Well, if you look at the diecast uh, company here, if you talk about biological hazards, example, they could be, they could have uh, what we call the the uh, diseases from the mosquitoes, like the, uh, the dengue mosquito, or maybe snake bite, or maybe some, um, what I call, um, biological infections, you know. Um, for example, if we have staff uh, in the company which is infected with um, disease, and this worker actually came to work, and his, this disease could have passed on to other workers, Economy hazards, um, referring to the body posture um, due to the long work where the, the workers have to stand for long hours. Uh, lifting of heavy objects, which could have uh, hurt their back. And other kinds of economic uh, hazards. Mechanical hazards, for example, like uh, having the hands trapped in between the machines, snapped by the machines, or fingers or body parts being um, what we call it, um, hurt by the machines or maybe uh, being hit by a, by a fault lift. Whereas electrical hazards, for example, electrocution. And finally, being in the, in the die cast company, we are exposed to um, flammability, fire, or perhaps the explosion. Now, the next one would be, once we have identified the hazard, it is very important that we need to determine how dangerous is the hazard? So we call it the risk. Now, likelihood is actually the event or the likelihood of a hazard could occur 
Well, severity refers to how severe would it be in terms of injury or health of people or damage to the uh, property which is caused by the event or caused by the hazard. So the risk is actually a likelihood multiplied with the severity. Here's an example, one of the many examples of quantitative method. Now, ladies and gentlemen, as I mentioned earlier, there is no absolute way or method or we call a risk analysis uh, that is uh, available in the market. Here on the screen is an example is an example of what we call the quantitative method. Um, if you look at the likelihood, there are five examples of uh, uh, levels of likelihood with different rating, as well as there's a table of severity rating with five levels of ratings. And um, many people could actually use this uh, table to make it more quanti quantifiable or more precise. Now, it is very important for the personnel of the organization to have a uh, all-round understanding and agreement with the ratings. So it is very important that the assessor, the, pre the persons who conduct the hierarchy, to understand how these ratings are to be used precisely. Okay? Now, as I mentioned earlier, once again, this is an example, and this is not the absolute, the, the absolute way of uh, rating a hazard. Now, once the risk has been assessed, we need to know what would be the level of the risk. Now, here is another example, um, which the, we use the same for, uh, ratings for likelihood and the same ratings for severity. As you can see on the screen, there are three colors. We have green, we have yellow, we have red. And of course, that um, is a multiplication. For example, if, it's, uh, uh, if, it's, if the likelihood is three, and if the uh, likelihood is five, and if the severity is three, we will get 15. And if it's 15, we classify as high risk. Uh, if it's yellow, we call it medium risk. If it's low, we call it low risk. Now. In the following slides, it is actually a, an example of a description of, on what should we do when we are at this different level of risk. Now we have green, we have low, we have yellow, we have red. So the, the organization needs to determine that uh, in precisely what would they have to do if the risk is classified as high. Likewise, when it is medium, and what, what would they have to do if it's low? Now, ladies and gentlemen, the organization has the freedom of hand to change this statement and the actions required to suit the organization's capability and from the economic point of view. Comes to the last part of the hierarchy, which is called the RC. So it is very important that uh, we need to know from the risk table what action to be taken. Now, if it's rate, rate means it requires immediate action to control the hazard in according to the hierarchy of control. Now let's talk about the hierarchy of control. The following slides after this will be will be about the hierarchy of control. Now before we talk about the hierarchy of control, we need to understand that when a, a hazard occurs and when there's an action or there's an activity in a company which is, a, if it's, which is causing a legal non-compliance, we will consider that activity of having significant risk. For example, during the assessment, if we found that there's a violation of PPE where the workers are found to be not utilizing the PPE, this is deemed as a violation of a law. In Malaysia, for example, we have regulation that regulate the necessity of employees to use the PPE. 
So during the assessment, if we found that, that there's a violation of using the PPE against a regulation, we will, uh, we will deem that as a significant risk. Then of course, we will refer back to this table again to determine once again, is an hazard a high risk hazard or is it a low risk hazard or is it a medium risk hazard? Now let's take a look at the red color high risk hazard. What should we do? Now it is very important in OSHAS 18001 where it stated that if an organization find a, risk, a hazard to be high risk, the organization must identify, determine and implement OSH objectives, targets and programs. These objectives, targets and programs are to be used to control, to mitigate and to improve the workplace so that the hazards would not become a high risk. Besides that, under the risk control action, we have to consider the importance of hierarchy of control. Now it is very important that when a hazard has been identified, whether it's medium risk or whether it's a high risk or even if it's a low risk, it is important that control must be implemented. However, we must first of all look and understand what is called the hierarchy of control. So ladies and gentlemen, in the next slides, you will see there are a few couple of levels of hierarchy of, hierarchy of control. The first level, at the most favorable one, if, you, if we wish to control a workplace hazard, would be to eliminate the hazard at the source. We call it elimination or substitution methodology. Okay. For example, if we can, if we can eliminate the work, or if we, can, if we can take away or eliminate the type of the dangerous activity, we could somehow eliminate the risk or the hazards. Or if we can't eliminate the hazard, we can try to substitute it so that the hazard will become less risk. For example, in the workplace we found a worker is using a very hazardous industrial glue. So if the organization could find a replacement or to substitute the industrial glue with a less, with a less, uh, with a less hazardous glue, this action is called substitution. The second level after the first one, the first choice, would be, we call it the engineering control. For example, in the workplace, there is um, what we call a high emission of noise uh, from the machines. If we can't eliminate the activity, if we can't substitute the activity, we have no choice but we have to resort to the next level, which we call it the engineering controls. What can we do with this noise? Now, there are a few choices here. First, we can isolate the place where the noise is coming from, from other places. We can protect the people from other places from being uh, exposed to the noise. Or we can redesign the workplace. We can design the workplace in such a way that the noise is contained. On the other hand, we could also replace human with automation. For example, we have the, the hazard of the, uh, the welding sparks. We could replace the human worker with the robotic control or the computer control robots to handle the spot welding process. The fourth choice under the engineering control, which we call it barriers, we could actually put up a barrier to protect injuries, to prevent injuries from the welding radiation. 
Noise. Let's try, for example, noise. We could actually put up some kind of a noise or baffles, a noise absorption material to absorb the noise in order to reduce the noise level. Or maybe, for example, chemicals. We can actually dilute the chemicals in order to make it less, less toxic. So ladies and gentlemen, these are the examples of what we call the engineering controls. Now, out of these two, comes to the third choice. If we find it is very difficult to implement engineering controls, we have a third choice. The third choice is known as administrative controls. In my personal opinion, administrative controls is not as effective as the first two choices does now. However, administrative controls is one of the favorites that uh, among the industrial players. Okay, in this example here, a couple of examples of administrative controls, such as we could actually uh, produce or, or prepare safe work procedures. We will, we can actually display these safe work procedures at the workplaces, where the workers uh, needs are required to follow the standardized safety practices as stated in procedures. At the same time, we could also provide supervision and ongoing and continuous trainings to the workers, as well as job rotations. Now, there are many other examples of administrative controls besides these three. All right, now, this is a third choice. And the last choice, which is the least effective choice of all the four, but it is also the most favorable choice in among the most uh, among among the most um, industrial players, is what we call the PPE. Now, PPE, as we know, stands for Personal Protective Equipment. It is actually a layer of protection that is to be used to protect the employees or the workers from injury. Now, as you can see on the screen here, PPE is always the last choice. The last choice of the hierarchy of control. Our workers must be trained to use and maintain the PPE. The employer and the workers must understand the limitation of the PPE. Do not treat PPE as a bulletproof vest. PPE is always the last choice. And PPE basically is not able to save a worker's life. So the employer is expected to require workers to use the PPE whenever it is needed. And bear in mind, PPE must be maintained in order to ensure the PPE is working properly. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, of four types of the, from these four types of controls, the best will be elimination. And however, PPE, as you can see on the screen here, will be always the last choice. So we have gone through the high rank HI, RARC. HI stands for hazard identification. RA stands for risk assessment, and RC stands for risk control. But at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, it is always very important that safe work procedures must be established. We must always ensure workers follow those safe work procedures. We must always train the workers to follow those safe work procedures. We must always Make sure the equipment and the materials we use are always in a safe condition. Now, safe work procedures must include regulatory requirements. Safe work procedures must be available to show the employees and the workers how and how important is the PPE and how to use the PPE. We need we need safe work procedures, okay, as a training material. We need to make sure the workers are responsible. We need to make sure the workers follow the sequence of steps 
as per the work procedures, we need to make sure outsiders like subcontractors work with the required working permits and we need to have emergency procedures as well. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Hyrex is an ongoing activity. It is not an one odd activity. It is not an activity where we only do it once and stop it forever. No. Hyrex needs to be reviewed from time to time. Hyrex needs to be updated from time to time. And Hyrex needs to be communicated to all employees so that everybody in the organization is aware the types of hazards in the other place. As you can see on this screen here, PPE is a last resort. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, here is an example of a hierarchy form. Basically, hierarch form is divided into three sections, which is uh, consists of hazard identification, the second section is called risk analysis, RA, and the third section is called the risk control. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is just a sample of a form. Many organizations have their own formats. They are welcome to have their own formats. They are welcome to have their own um, way of assessment. However, no matter how customized it would be, the methodology of HIREC has to be followed. Thank you very much for listening. Over to you, Susanna. Yes, Mr. Steven, thank you. Great presentation. Uh, we have some questions that we would like you to answer. Uh, the first question says, is the principle of res ipsa loquitur applicable for hazard that occurred to a worker due to the direction of the organization? Sorry, Susanna, could you repeat the question again? Is the principle of res ipsa loquitur applicable for a hazard that occurred to a worker due to the direction of the organization? Respirator. Yes, uh, the, uh, apparently there's a principle called uh, res ipsa loquitur. So is that applicable? Uh, sorry, yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm not so familiar with that principle. Yeah. Oh, okay, no worries. Then we will continue with the other question. Uh, uh, what do you do to uh, to do the residual uh, risk? Sorry, what risk is that? Uh, uh, how do you decrease the risk? Oh, how do we decrease risk? Now, um, my answer would be, first of all, we need to understand what is the source of the hazard. The source of the hazard is very important. We need to identify the source of the hazard. Once we know the source of the hazard or the sources of the hazard, we need to look at the what would be the most suitable way of controls. Now, as you can see on the screen just now, the, uh, uh, we, we, when I talk about the hierarchy of control, basically there are four levels of hierarchy of control. We need to see which level or which type of control is suitable for the source of the hazard. So, it is very important that when we take an action to mitigate or to decrease the risk, we must make sure that the action does not create another new risk. And that is my answer for that. Okay, thank you, Mr. Steven. Uh, the other question is, uh, why is it important to do reviews and monitor your risk assessment? Thank you. Now, first of all, um, for example, back in Malaysia, it is stated in the guideline that the organization is required to review the HIREC at least once annually. Now, if there is no such regulation in your countries, we need to uh, review it occasionally, not only once a year. Um, when do we need to review them? For example, um, when there is an accident occurred, we need to review the likelihood rating and the severity rating once again. When an accident has occurred, it is very important that the organization 
must to review the risk level, the, the risk rating. For example, before before the accident occur, the rating of likelihood could be one. But when an accident has occurred, the rating of the ex of the hazard is no longer one. It has to be higher than one. So by doing the reviewing of the rating, we will be able to see that a hazard right now has now become a, 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 is very serious because of the accident. Now, second situation when a review is required is when there is a change in the regulation of your countries. The, the, we were talking about the occupational safety and health regulations. So as and when there is such change to the regulations, the organization needs to review the activities in the company to see whether the risk level and the hazards identified before the change of the regulation and after the change of regulation in order to ensure that uh, all activities and all hazards are identified. And thirdly, the situation where, we, where review is required is when there is a significant change to the activities in the organization. For instance, a year ago, there wasn't any laser cutting process. But today, there is a laser, laser cutting process. So when you have a laser cutting process, you need to include this laser cutting process into your hierarchy because you need to identify what are the hazards and the risk of this laser cutting process. So basically, ladies and gentlemen, these are the three major situations where you need to review the hierarchy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Steven. We have uh, more questions. Uh, what documentation should be done for a risk assessment? Thank you, Susanna. Now, the first one, you need to have a HIRARC worksheet. Uh, you, as you can see on the screen just now, uh, there's an example of the worksheet. Um, on the last page, I believe. Uh, let me go through it in. Yeah, this is the uh, example of the worksheet. All right, this is example of the worksheet. And uh, and uh, besides having the worksheet, um, you need to have a procedure, uh, and the hierarchy procedure. And the, the hierarchy procedure of yours must dis describe and define very clearly what are the ratings, the, 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 the rating tables, that the, the ratings they're going to use. Now, as I said before, uh, different companies have different ways of assessing the risk level. Uh, you can use qualitative and quantitative method. However, whichever method you are using to rate the risk, the, the hazard, you've got to define it in the, in the HIRA, RC procedure. So you need to have a hierarchy procedure. You need to establish a hierarchy worksheet and uh, that's it in terms of you talking about the documentation. And the results of the hierarchy will, at the end of the day, will determine what else, what kind of documents will you need. For example, from the hierarchy, you may, uh, you may have identified uh, that you need to control the emission of noise. That therefore, you need to create a, work, a safety work procedure on how to um, control the noise. Uh, a procedure to, to guide the workers on how to protect themselves from uh, exposing to the excessive noise and how to do a, a work properly so that uh, how to use a, pro a, a proper PPE to protect their hearing. And these are some of the documents uh, that uh, the, uh, an organization can prepare. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Steven. Uh, other question says, uh, what is the difference between activity hazard analyze and HIRAC? Okay, activity is actually the activities in the organization. Now, the, as I mentioned, an organization may carry out various types of activities depending on the nature of the business of theirs. For example, um, if we are talking about uh, an hospital, their activities are many. For example, they have uh, patients administration. They have uh, uh, recorded the uh, radiology activity. They have the uh, uh, operation uh, surgery activity. Uh, they have uh, patient discharge activity. 
So if you compare with uh, other kinds of organizations, which is, uh, is for example, a, a manufacturing plant, a uh, die casting uh, factory, they have a, a melting process, they have a loading and unloading um, process or activities, they have the uh, inspection activities. Then uh, likewise, if you go to a, um, a library, a library with, uh, it has many activities or, or processes. For example, they have uh, students uh, a registration activity. They have the uh, uh, book arra books books arrangements activity. They need to use computer to update the uh, the archive and many more. So activities or process actually uh, it depends on the nature of the business of the organization. Now hierarchy. Hazard identification, risk assessment, and risk control is a method to identify what kind of hazards can they found in each of these activities. For example, in radiology activity in a hospital, a uh, hospital has a radiology activity. Now, this activity, the hazard that we can see in this activity, for example, exposure uh, to the uh, X-ray, the ray, uh, where the workers, the radiologists, may be exposed to the uh, the ray. So this is a hazard, all right? This is called HI. We have to identify the hazard. Now, risk assessment would be we need to determine how likelihood is this radiologist uh, may expose to the ray, and what will be the consequence, and how serious would it be? Uh, it depends on what kind of PPE is putting on, and how serious would it be being exposed to the ray? So this HI RARC is a way to assess the workplace hazards for each of the activity in the organization. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lim. Uh, other question is, uh, should the hazard or the process that is causing the hazard be eliminated? And give an example. All right. Now, if I have a choice, I would like to eliminate that process. You know, uh, in the hierarchy of control, the, the, the best choice would be to eliminate the hazard. But uh, to eliminate the hazard altogether, we got to uh, either we change the process or we got to eliminate the process. For example, um, I have a process called um, uh, um, what do you call that? Um, uh, all right, I, I have a process where I, I I have a worker who has to uh, stick two pieces of uh, foam together uh, manually using an, a, a very hazardous industrial glue. Now, I may have, I may have to make a decision whereby uh, I, I do not want this process to be conducted anymore in my factory. You know, I do not want this, this process where the operator needs to stick two pieces of foam together to be carried anymore in my company. So what I'll do is that is is either I I, I shut down that 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 the work the that this process, or I transfer this process out to another uh, subcontractor to do it. So by eliminating this process from my activities, I have managed to reduce one of the hazards. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lim. Uh, other question says, do I need to use a consultant in this whole process of risk assessment? Thank you. Now, basically, you do not need a consultant to do this, um, but you need to make sure uh, your team, your members, uh, who is going to carry out this assessment, are trained, are well trained by somebody, uh, by a trainer, by a consultant. But to carry out this assessment, well, if the if the team is competent enough, they could actually carry on their own. But they have to be trained first. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And the last question, it uh, says, what are the most unusual issues that may come up during the risk assessment process? <laughs> well, um, from my past experience for the past 12 years of uh, consulting and training people in this area, um, people have this uh, mentality where they will always try not to identify as many hazards as possible because they do not want to take up the responsibilities to, to implement an action or actions to control the hazards. So in their mind, the more hazards I found, 
the more works I have to do to control them. So, but this is really in contrast to the, the whole idea of hierarchy. You know, the hierarchy is actually to benefit the employees and the workers. But however, they have this the opposite mindset where they think, um, if I found more hazards in my workplace, wouldn't that be a trouble to me? Or to some employers, they will prefer not to found not to find too many hazards in the workplace because. You know, it, it may give uh, some kind of a uh, bad reputation and fear to the workers. So um, this is, uh, I wouldn't say unique or odd, but this is actually a fact. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lim, I would like to thank you once again for this lovely presentation. Uh, I would also like to thank all the attendees for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this webinar. Uh, we have received uh, all of your questions, and because the time is limited, we will answer to your questions individually by email. And also, don't forget to check PCB's webinar schedule on our website, pcb.com, or our official social media sites, since next week we are organizing webinars on interesting topics. Next Tuesday, we are hosting a webinar on the topic occupational health and safety application in the oil and gas sector. Thank you once again.